The main character is a high school student who went on a school bus trip. He was sitting next to a classmate with whom he was good friends, but he liked another girl to whom he wanted to confess his feelings on this trip. The girl who was sitting in the next seat is his childhood friend. Technically, she was his assistant in this operation. She turned to him and angrily asked why he was nervous. The guy replied that this was not the case, but the girlfriend said that everything was written on his face, and he was definitely afraid of what awaits them on the trip. Then she asked if he was crazy when he decided to confess his love to their classmate. She was not only the most beautiful in their class in school, but in the whole city. Shirayuki Yui was very popular and unattainable. The young man replied to his friend that he understood this perfectly well. The girl said that she helped him for free only because he entrusted this secret to her alone. But in fact she did not approve of his idea, fearing that the most popular girl would laugh at him when he confessed. Suddenly, a magical portal formed in front of the bus and the transport moved to another dimension with a great roar. There was a panic among the students. Their teacher Minami Sensei asked everyone to stay calm and hold hands. After the crash, they got off the bus to find out what happened. They were surrounded by knights in armor, similar to medieval ones, and demanded that they immediately all come out and follow them. Although the knights themselves looked like they belonged to an ancient era, they were huge robots standing around them, signifying the massive technological progress of this world. The guy's name was Yuta, and his girlfriend was Najisa. A classmate touched her friend's shoulder, afraid of what was happening. A man in rich clothes approached them and greeted them as earthlings, saying that they were in another world. Minami-sensei asked the stranger if he knew what had happened and how they got here. The man replied that they had called from in order to sell to other people. Ancient tools called bellows were used in this world. These mats have been used in civil engineering, shipping, and many other fields for the convenience of mankind. Robots need a special kind of energy to operate. But in the world called Fabra, where they were now, there was very little of this energy. They didn't have enough pilots, so they stole people from Earth who had this energy in their bodies. The energy was called the value of Rudia. The inhabitants of Faber conducted a lot of research, taking people from Earth to come to the conclusion that they were the ones who possessed this power to control the Mechs. Minami-sensei said it was selfish to take people from another world against their will when their families and their usual lives are waiting for them there. One of the knights grabbed the woman and pinned her arms to the ground. The leader of the knights apologized that they had to end their past lives and said that their life as slaves would not be as bad as they imagined. In any case, they had no choice, and they could not stand in the way against an armed army and mechs. As he left, the man told them to rest and pray that their rudia value would be high enough for a good life, as they would be auctioned off and only luck would help them get into good hands. Yuta lay down on the floor in the room where they were sent for the night. His classmate named Haranishi asked a friend, as he assumed, what was the meaning of Rudia. Yuta was surprised that his classmate had already begun to adapt to this world so quickly, and did not think about his home as others did. He replied that the fact was that as he realized that the higher this Rudia was, the better their food, housing and medical services would be, and therefore he was worried about the upcoming energy measurements. Haranishi asked another classmate named Mikik what he thought about it. The guy replied that he thought that the man had deceived them. But if it was true, then Yuki-sen had a chance to get the highest Rudia energy points, since she was the most outstanding and talented girl in their class, and she managed everything easily. Yuta replied that they had little chance, but he also believed that Shirayuki-san would have the highest scores. After the rest, the class lined up to the machine that measured the Rudia value. One of the guys was recognized as a double Highlander, and the other as a triple. The man leading the report and recording the scores said that this time they were very lucky that there were two Highlanders among the abducted people at once. Then there was Haranishi-san, but his scores were not as high as those of the Highlanders, as well as the few people in the queue who came after him. Soon, Shirayuki-san stood on the platform of the device. Her Rudia value was 36,000. She was declared a triple Highlander, and her score was the highest among all those gathered. Magisa was next. She exchanged glances with Yuta and stood on the semi-landing module. After the scan, the computer announced that her scores were 6,500. After her was Yuta himself. To the surprise of the workers, his Rudia value was only two units. The staff double-checked again and said that there was no mistake, the arrow really showed the number two. After that, the auction of those called up from Earth began. The first was a Highlander, whose initial bid was 12,000. It was bought for 160 million local currency. All the other guys thought that right now, they, the sophomores from the third grade, would split up and most likely never see each other again. 
Some were sold for millions, and some even for billions. It was Shirayuki Sen's turn. She came on stage, and as a triple Highlander, a representative of the Irish Empire paid 12 billion for her. This empire tried to buy the most outstanding warriors more often than others, and they were ready to pay any money. Najisa was next. Her status was half Gorian. It was sold for 20 million gold. At the moment when both girls went to their owners, Yuta realized that he was really breaking up with them and would no longer meet his close friends. Then the host announced that they had one more young man left, who would be of little use since his rudia value is only two units, but according to the rules of the auction, they must put him up as well. Apologizing to the guests, he offered to buy Yuta as a souvenir, at least for one gold piece, if someone still wants to. The guests laughed, calling Yuta pathetic, but still a buyer was found. A very angry-looking man said he would take it away, but would not pay a single coin for it and threw two nuts as payment. After the auction, the man got on a motorcycle and told Yuta not to hesitate and get in the back. Najisa was walking towards her carriage. She looked longingly in the direction where Yuta had gone, worried about what fate awaited him because his score was extremely low. In the evening, Yuta arrived at the place. The owner threw him into the barn and said that now he would live here. The guy asked if they would give him food, but the man replied that there had already been food delivery today, so he would have to wait until tomorrow. The man locked the door and went out. Yuta sat down on the floor and saw that there were many slaves in the barn. They were emaciated, in torn clothes. A girl came up to him and asked if he was hungry. It seems that only now did Yuta fully realize that he had entered another world forever, and in this new world for him, slavery was legal. All these people were imprisoned, starved, and worked for a cruel master. He thought about Najisa and Shureyuki. What kind of people would they get to? Will they starve? Or will they be lucky to live with good people because of their high scores? That evening, two knights standing guard over the building where the value of the ore was being measured discussed that one guy received an indicator of only two units. One knight told the other that he was standing behind at that moment and saw that the arrow made a full turn before stopping at two. Another said that the device could not change up to 10,000 and had never heard of the value being higher and the arrow making a circle. They concluded that after all, the guy's value was two units and he wouldn't even be able to activate the mechs. The girl handed Yuta a small piece of food that she had stashed away for a rainy day. An elderly woman, calling the girl by the name Nanami, tried to dissuade her from this act so that she would not waste her supplies for the sake of a novice. Yuta said that there was no need to share with him, and it was better to leave this food for later. Nanami explained that they were given food only once every three days, so he would not eat soon, and asked him not to refuse her offer. Yuta offered to split it in half and thanked him for the treat. At night they went to sleep on the cold floor. Yuta was shivering from the cold, and at one point, the sleeping Nanami snuggled up to him from behind. The young man turned to her, and at that moment decided that he would try to make friends with the girl. The next morning, the master opened the barn door and forced all the slaves to go to work in the fields. They received food in the afternoon. Yuta was surprised at how little they were given, but Yuta said it was better than nothing. The guy asked the girl how she ended up in this place. Nanami drooped and said that her mother had sold her. For the sale, she received money for expenses for a month and Nanami herself accepted it. Yuta was afraid that he had put pressure on the patient, but the girl said that everything was fine. However, at night, she cried bitterly. The guy was very sorry. He hugged his girlfriend tightly and said that everything would be fine. After this incident, they became closer and Nanami began to open up to Yuta and smile more often. One day she found a rag doll near the estate and showed it to him. Yuta congratulated Nanami on his find. However, later the owner got very angry and demanded to return the doll. He intended to beat Nanami, accusing her of theft, but Yuta stood up for the girl. As a result, the owner beat Yuta. Nanami hugged the guy and said that it didn't matter to her that she had lost the doll, and it was much more important that Yuta was alive. The guy, hugging the girl back, was glad that she was so kind. In the evening of the same day, the owner said that his slaves would not receive food today, and left the barn. Yuta noticed that the man had not locked the door. The other slaves replied that it slammed shut by itself and only a person with a rudia value of at least 300 could open it, but among them there were only those with an index of less than 100. Yuta decided to try and pushed on the door. To the surprise of the others, it opened. The young man told the others that if they wanted, they could stay here, but he was leaving. He called Nanami with him, and she, without thinking twice, followed the guy. Finally, the old lady asked the guy what was his meaning of Rudia. Yuta replied that his energy was only two points. Yuta and Nanami reached the big city and decided to look for work. However, they were refused everywhere, due to the low value of the ore. As a result, Yuta was able to find a job on the ship. 
After going to the cabins, the captain of the ship said that he would give them food twice a day and pay three gold pieces for the trip. Yuda and Nanami agreed, as they had nothing to choose from. He took them to a place where they would sleep and said that if they had any questions, they could ask the local guys. There were only middle-aged men on the ship, which at first Yuda and Nanami were a little scared of. One of the workers said that their job was to make the mechanism by which the ship sailed rotate. The higher the rudium value, the easier it is to push the coil. But none of them knew this for sure, since they were the same slaves with a rudia value of less than a hundred. They can only sleep and eat on the ship, and it is forbidden to leave it until the work is finished. The workers prepared to leave, and began to drag a heavy mechanism that could not rotate on its own. Yuta took hold of the spool, and also began to push. After touching it, the mechanism began to spin wildly, and the ship sailed quickly. When they arrived on the other side, the rich gentleman paid each slave ten gold pieces and said that now they could go outside. Yuta was surprised, and asked one of the sailors if they would run away, since they were released. The man replied that they had no choice but to return, because with such a low value of ore they would not be accepted anywhere else anyway, and money and food were needed. Yuta and Nanami decided not to return to the ship, and went in search of another job in a new city. Ikari Najisa arrived at the palace where she was supposed to serve. A girl about the same age as Najisa herself approached her and introduced herself as the second princess of Amuria named Lainel. The princess promised the girl that she would treat her as an equal and help her adapt to the new world. People with a high Rudia value were appreciated everywhere. In such a small country like theirs, Najisa will undoubtedly be pampered. Najisa asked, how badly are people treated with a low Rudia value? Lainel replied that they were treated very badly. Najisa said that there was one guy at the auction whose value was only two units. They were childhood friends, he was very dear, and also, she was in love with him, so she was very worried about his fate. Lainel sympathetically told the girl that she would try to find this guy and outbid him. Najisa thanked the princess, and then they went to the ruler of Amuria, Majuni. The man greeted the half-mountain man. Lainel asked her father to smile more, as Najisa was very nervous. Lainel's younger sister asked her to introduce her as well. The third princess was named Himari. The middle sister asked the younger one where their eldest, Yukiha, was. The girl replied that she was where she always was. Lainel brought Najisa to the place where the bellows were kept. Yukiha was sitting inside one of them. Seeing the new girl, Yukiha climbed out and greeted Najisa. She said that there was a robot in front of them which was called a magical Raspera Mech. 5,000 ores are needed to control it. The maximum was up to 12,000. His armor was B-grade and his strength was a grade. This is the strongest fur in their country. Lainel said that Yukiha had failed to activate Rasper, and therefore they needed a pilot with a value of at least 5,000 ores. Najisa asked if they planned to use her in the war. Yukiha replied that other pilots were indeed used in war, but in their small and peaceful country, Mechs were not used for war, but to create better conditions for the lives of citizens. Yuta and Nanami were walking around the market. They had money, and the young man decided to buy the girl a new dress and shoes, as she had completely turned into rags. The girl said it was the first time she had chosen clothes. Yuta paid two gold and twenty silver coins, and gradually began to understand the local monetary rate. They still had seventeen gold and eighty silver coins left. After that, they decided to rent a hotel room to properly relax on soft beds and take a bath. Nanami said she had never taken a bath in her life. Yuta told the girl to undress, and they went to a small sauna. The young man helped his friend wash her hair and back, and noticed that although her breasts were small, they were still noticeable. He asked her how old she was, and Nanami replied that she was 14. The guy felt awkward, because he thought Nanami was only 10, but it turned out that he was only 3 years older than her. It was wrong that they were both naked in the same room. In his homeland, he would have already been imprisoned for such actions. He wanted to leave, but Nanami asked him to stay. She said she wasn't shy about him, and she needed his help since she couldn't wash. The guy agreed, but asked the girl to wash her lower body on her own. Nanami then volunteered to rub Yuta's back, even though he refused. At that moment, Yuta decided that since Nanami treated him like an older brother, he would protect and protect her until the very end. The next morning, they dressed in new clothes and went looking for work again. Unfortunately, Yuta and Nanami were not taken anywhere. Rudia's two points got in the way of the guy everywhere. To save money, he bought one loaf of bread, and after sharing it with the girl, he asked for forgiveness that they would have to live like this for some time. Nanami replied that she was not worried, because the most important thing was that she was with him. At that moment, a middle-aged man in a suit and hat came up to them and said that he had heard their dialogue that they needed a job. 
He had one business for which he was willing to pay 50 gold pieces a month. Yuta asked what they would have to do. The man replied that he had a daughter about their age and he wanted them to talk to her. Not thinking that there might be a catch in this offer and wanting money, Yuta agreed to the offer. The girl turned out to be half a beast. She had pointed ears like a fox or a wolf and a nose like an animal's. The man said it was the curse of a half-beast. He was an aristocrat, and he had many competitors in trade, and apparently one of his enemies decided to annoy him in this way. Yuta approached the girl and told her his name and Nanami's name. The beast girl extended her hand for a handshake in response to Yuta's hand and said her name was Falma. The guy said that from that day on they were friends. Nanami grabbed Falma's hand and pulled her along to play. Yuta realized that because of the curse, the other children did not want to communicate and play with Falma, and it was unlikely that she wanted to leave the house at all. Therefore, her father was looking for an environment for her so that she would not be lonely, and was ready to pay money for it. The man told the young man that the others he brought here, as soon as they saw Falma, ran away in horror, calling her a monster and a dangerous beast and was surprised that Yuta and Nanami began to communicate with her without prejudice. Then the gentleman allocated a room for them and prepared food for them. Thus began a new life in the Belfast house. As a result, a whole month has passed. One morning, the guys were playing in the yard. Yuta could not catch up with his friends in any way, and suddenly he saw a fur in one of the sheds of the house. Falma approached him and told him that their civilization did not know how to build these robots. These were the technologies of the previous era. The Mets were created with the help of a core, which was launched using the energy of Rudia. Modern people dug robots out from under the earth and sand, and could only build a new body around the core. This instance was broken, and no one could run the kernel, so the girl's father bought it just as a collector's item. After that, she asked Yut what was his Rudia score. The guy replied that his score was only two, and then decided to find out what Nanami's score was. The door from the barn where the slaves lived could not be opened unless you had 300 points, and the old lady said that there was no one among them who had at least 100 points. The girl admitted that she did not know how much Rudia's meaning was in her, and had never touched that barn door. Mr. Belfast was called home by an employee of the measurement center after he found out that Nanami did not know her scores. After the device scanned her, it turned out that her Rudia potential was equal to 32,000, and she was a triple Highlander. Mr. Belfast told the girl that he could report her to the authorities so that she could be appointed a pilot. But Nanami refused, saying she wanted to stay close to Yuta and Falma. The man was glad that his daughter had such a friend. Shurayuki was still worried about her classmates, dreading the day of the auction. Shurayuki arrived in the kingdom to which she was sold. The man accompanying her ordered the army to respectfully greet the triple highlander. After that, he escorted her to the king. The king told the girl to swear eternal service to him. After the reception at the king's, the escort showed the girl the hangar in which the standard models of the magician were stored. Mechanisms and models of a higher rank. Her robot was called Elvara, it was designed for a triple highlander. The potential for activation was needed at least 30,000, and the maximum reached up to 3 million. The strength and maneuverability were of the 55th rank. A long-haired young man appeared next to them, saying that this robot was really very powerful. The elder called him Mr. Yudo, and said that he did not expect to see him here. The young man greeted the new girl, and said that he had been sold in the same way five years ago, and he was also from Japan. One of the subordinates called Mr. Yuta as they had finished preparing the Ajola. The man said goodbye to Shurayuka. Yuta was a five-time Highlander. His Rudia potential was 57,000. He was recognized as the strongest pilot on the continent. Thanks to him, their country, the Empire of Alicia, is considered the most powerful on the continent. Therefore, he often allowed himself more than the Emperor himself. The escort advised the girl to make friends with Mr. Yuta and then said that she would be taught how to use Elvara tomorrow. Shurayuki asked the man for one request. She said that a guy was sold at the auction for the fruit. He had only two Rudia points, but she liked him very much, and she was worried about his fate. The man said that he would order to outbid him and deliver him to Alicia. Shurayuki thanked the elder, and said that since childhood she had had sympathy for the kind character of Yuta and was going to admit it to him on a school trip, until everything turned out that way. Mr. Belfast came home and informed Nanami and Yuta that rumors had spread about the girl's potential, and the authorities would arrive here very soon to capture her. The man said that he would try to detain the army, and in the meantime they would have to escape through the emergency exit. At the same moment, a voice sounded outside the door, announcing that the sixth detachment of the magical mechanisms of the army of Rudavan had arrived. 
By imperial decree, they came to take a triple Highlander girl into service. Lord Belfast shouted back at them that he didn't have any girl. Falma was very upset that her friends had to leave, and they were most likely breaking up forever. Mr. Belfast thanked the guys for the time they spent together and for becoming friends with his daughter. Suddenly, a shot rang out. The bullet flew through the door and hit Mr. Belfast. Falma ran to her father. Putting him on her lap, she tearfully asked him to live. The man apologized to his daughter for not being able to be with her anymore. He then asked Yuta to take Falma with him, as he did not want her to be sad. He stroked his daughter's hair and said that he was glad to see her smile and just playing games with friends, like a very ordinary girl. It's the best thing that could happen to him before he died. Falma replied that she had been happy since birth, since he was by her side. Mr. Belfast opened his eyes in surprise, and then died. Yuta, Nanami and Falma hid behind the wall of the building, thinking about how they could avoid the soldiers. Then they saw the shed where the mecha was located and decided to hide inside the robot. They climbed the ladder into the cockpit. There was a box inside. Yuta asked Falma what was in it. The girl replied that she did not know, but Dad had previously told her that if something happened, she should take her with her. The Mets of Rudavan's army went inside. When they noticed the old robot, they decided that it was non-working, and it was unlikely that it could be repaired. One of the soldiers offered to break it with a spear. The children were afraid that now the spear would pierce the cockpit, where they were. Yuta decided to activate the mechanism of the old robot. Falma said that mechs are controlled through consciousness. Thinking of Mr. Belfast, Yuta was able to awaken the mecha and block the enemy's spear strike. He then struck at Rudoan's gobs, piercing their armor. The soldiers were amazed, because their armor was so strong that no one could penetrate it yet. Falma said that Rudavan's zobs were no match for them. After that, Yuta, Nanami and Falma decided to make their way through the remaining army in the same way, and escape from the mansion. Yuta came out of the hangar and saw that three mechs were standing against him. The soldiers immediately realized that this magical mechanism had defeated two of their comrades and assumed that the triple Highlander they had come for was driving. Yuta pounced on one Zobs, and grabbing him, used him as a shield against two other robots. He then destroyed the other two by thrusting spears into them. The power of this mech was incredible. Yuta exhaled, and said, and rejoicing that he had coped, asked Falma where they should run to. The Beast Girl replied that they needed to cross the border and get to the trading state of Alpeca. Perhaps Rudavan's army won't get them there. There were paths along this path that an ordinary person would not follow. This is what they needed. Nanami asked her friend if their mechanism caught the eye of other people. Falma replied that it would be nice to get them a transport vehicle, a flying machine carrying mechs. Ordinary citizens, whose work was connected with the use of magical mechanisms, or the rich had such a transport vehicle. Yuta apologized to his friend, because her father died because of them. Falma replied that they were not to blame for anything, and Rudavan was responsible for everything. She shouted that she would never forgive the country for this, and Nanami offered to take revenge on them. Yuta gave his consent, and then Falma said that they should find a second magician in Alpec, a mechanism for Nanami. She also thought that the potential of Rudia Yuta was far from two. It was a mistake. The magic mechanism they were in now couldn't make even the triple Highlanders work. Perhaps it had a more surprising non-standard meaning. An army of mechs moved through the dead city, where the last pieces of meat and skin were pecked from the skeletons of the birds. One of the pilots was Minami Sensei. The people from the country that bought it were very kind. There was plenty of food, she had a large and beautiful house, and everyone respected and revered her. But she didn't want that. Commander Muji ordered Minami Sensei, calling her deputy commander Ruriko, to attack the front squad, and then flank them with the second platoon. Minami accepted the order and went on the attack. She participated in the war as befits a mech pilot. But in fact, she still considered herself a teacher and planned to protect all her students and return with them to the old world. The commander then radioed that she had switched to a private channel and asked Minami to talk to her after the battle. Minami reported that the enemy squad, consisting of 12 mechanisms, had been detected. The second platoon was in position. The commander ordered to attack the enemy from three sides. After the battle, the enemy was destroyed. The country that Ruriko belonged to won. Their squad ordered the enemy to surrender and exit the magic mechanisms. The enemies turned out to be Uba Sekura and Taguchi Nami, Manami, Sensei's students. The teacher tensed when she saw her students and asked where the rest of their squad was. The girls replied that they did not know this. The squad leader, Minami, shot one of the girls in the arm and repeated his question. Uba, trying to calm the pain and stop the blood from her hand, said she didn't know where their squad was anyway. 
The commander decided to destroy the girls with a sword, but suddenly, his weapon was blocked by Minami, sitting in a fur, wielding the same sword. The commander asked the deputy what was she doing. She replied that no one dares to offend her students. A battle began between them. The commander radioed in, asking his deputy why she was attacking her. Mariko didn't answer. The commander began shouting to the others to stop Minami, who, apparently, had gone crazy. Mariko immobilized the mechs of her own squad for a while and told the girls to get into the cockpit of her mecha urgently. The commander stood up and holding his sword up to his subordinate, said that he would not let her pass. She, gathering her hair into a ponytail, said that she was obliged to ensure the safety of her students and they would return to earth with them. Yuta, Nanami and Falma arrived in the trading state of Alpeka. The city center looked rich and prosperous, but the outskirts were filled with barracks and other poor houses. Wearing a hood over her head to hide her animal ears, Falma went to a pawn shop to sell the jewelry that was in her father's casket. Yuta wanted to dissuade the girl, because this was the last memory of her father, but in the end he allowed her to do what she had in mind, asking her to try to sell for as much as possible. Falma said that she would get only one stone for testing, and would go to several places to find out where the price would be put for it. One merchant said he would buy it for two million, the second called the price at one million, and the third offered only ten thousand. After that, the three friends gathered at the cafe table, deciding to sell to the first one who offered them the highest price. A bearded man approached them and told them to forget about that merchant, otherwise they would regret it. Nanami told the others that this guy looked too suspicious. The man approached them and introduced himself by the name of Jean. After that, he explained that that merchant was a famous big shot. First, he names a high price for the stones, and when the rest are brought to him, he finds some defect in them and resets the price to a minimum. It was a common thing in their city. After that, Jean told them that if they hired him, it would be a profitable offer for them. He began to convince the company that he would be able to sell them to another merchant for one and a half times more expensive but one-tenth of it would be to him as payment for the service. If he can't help them sell the stones, they won't pay him anything. Yuta and Falma did not trust the guy, but they understood that they were bad at negotiations and bidding. As a result, they decided to talk to the merchant first, and then give way to Jean. They showed the first merchant they had the whole jewelry box. He said that the stones were not very good, and agreed to take them all for 10 million. Jean said he would take them to another place and sell the stones for more than 12 million. When they arrived at the right place, Jean named the price of the entire box at 15 million. Looking at the stones through a magnifying glass, the man said that 15 was too much. Jean began to convince the pawn shop employee that all the stones were of high quality, and only the two stones he pointed out were already worth more than 10 million, so how can he tell him that 15 million is too much? After that, he shouted that he also owned a retail chain and saw what the man was thinking, trying to buy high-quality stones for cheap, and threatened that if he did not agree to buy stones for the specified price, he would tell everyone about the machinations in his office. The man got nervous because of the moral pressure and asked if they would do anything if he bought the stones for 20 million. Jean began to shout again that he knew the value of his stones, and then the man, whose name was Linbit, whispered in horror the amount of 30 million gold. He didn't have any more money. Yuta, Nanami, and Falma went to the room with Jean to count all the bags of money. The young man was amazed that Jean, who promised to sell one and a half times as much, ended up selling three times as much. Jean asked the guys what they planned to do with such a huge amount. Yuta replied that they were planning to buy a magic mechanism. Realizing that the pilots were sitting in front of him, Jean asked what kind of mecha they needed. The guys replied that they needed such a robot for which the launch should be at least 10,000 rupees. The man was surprised that the children were Highlanders. Falma replied that she and Yuta were not like that. Jean said that 100 million gold pieces are needed to buy a fur for Highlander. Yuta tensed, because they no longer had any stones, and there was nothing to sell to accumulate such a sum. Jean said that for Highlander, it is not difficult to earn money in search. He led them to a place where sword fights were held between pilots. Ordinary viewers placed bets on them. The winner of the fight received his winnings. The mechs were issued by the organization itself, conducting private battles. All they had to do was submit a request, get into the magic mechanism and win. Then he said that Highlanders are not often seen in such fights, so they will definitely win and earn money. Nanami asked Yuta if he was confident that he could defeat such a strong opponent, whom they were watching in the ring. Jean was surprised that it was not Nanami who was going to join the battle, but Yuta, who was not a Highlander. He asked the guy how many oars he had. Yuta replied that there were only two units, but he didn't have to worry about him. 
Jean was outraged why the guy got into a fight with a deuce. Wouldn't it be better if Nanami went? Yuta replied that they really had no other choice. He was about to engage in battle with his already existing magic mechanism, which only he can activate. Jean said that he had never heard of such a thing, and with a deuce it is impossible even to light a magic lantern. Yuta said that his magic mechanism is very strangely arranged, so he can't explain everything. The second fight was announced at the stadium. The presenter loudly named the ko, pilot who won several times in a row, Yamakura Shinsuke. Yuta remembered that this was the name of his classmate. Against Yamakura was a veteran of sword fighting, whose total number of victories exceeded 500. It was a bald old man with a mustache. He furiously told Yamakura that he would teach him a lesson today so that the young people would not get arrogant. Yuta remembered that Yamakura was a reserved guy, and he didn't talk much to anyone. Right now, Shinsuke grinned maliciously in the cockpit, in response to the old man's screams, and dealt him a crushing blow. At the moment of the fight, he shouted at the opponent, which would make him regret that he did not immediately give up. Yuta realized that he was wrong about the identity of his classmate. The old man pulled out a giant hand and grabbed Yamakura's furs. He said that this giant arm was designed to destroy large robots, and no one has ever gotten out of it. Yamakura replied that he could not be defeated that way, and got out of his hand by blowing it up. After that, he hit the old man's magic mechanism a couple more times and completely destroyed it, winning. He climbed out onto his robot's shoulder to smile at the crowd. Yuta no longer saw in him the quiet man he had been at school. There was a new person in front of him. Jean warned Yuta that these battles are being fought to the death, and he must be prepared for the fact that if the opponent is stronger than him, then most likely he will die. Yuta said that he was ready for this and was even glad if he could find an opponent equal to him in strength. He asked Jean to find him a strong and wealthy opponent. A man with black hair and beard was sitting in the bar, and he was drinking more than the first bottle. Jean came to a middle-aged man with a beard and a scar on his eye. He asked the guy why he, the great red dragon Kejin, had to fight some newbie. He refused to fight Yuta, calling him a trifle. Jean replied that he was very sorry, because they gave 20 million for the fight. Kejin did not expect such a high amount, and deciding that it would be easier to defeat the kid, and in fact he would get easy money, he agreed to fight with him. This was Yuta's first experience. His fight was announced in the afternoon. His magical Yuta mechanism was moved to the ring. The young man himself was stopped by an employee at the reception desk, saying that the field of his questionnaire, where the pseudonym is entered, was empty. She asked me to come up with a suitable pseudonym right now. Yuta remembered that he once had a favorite anime in which a powerful white lion named Elio fought. He decided to choose this word as a pseudonym. After the questionnaire was filled out, he went to the field to his robot. The presenter announced over the loudspeaker that the first battle between the pilot of the Ute and his magic mechanism of the Elio was about to take place. Jean asked the guy to pretend that the victory was given to him with great difficulty. Yuta asked why it was necessary to do this. Jean, calling him a fool, said that an uncertain victory would affect the next match. The host announced the opponent of Yuta, an average swordsman who won 50 victories, the Red Dragon Kejin and his Halga mechanism. As many as 57 bets were placed on Yuta's loss, while only 18 were placed on Kejin. The battle has begun. Yuta ran up to his opponent, and hitting him, he felt that he was slower than the Zobs he had fought earlier. The enemy was completely open and could easily be counterattacked. but Jean asked Yuta to win an uncertain victory, so he hesitated. Yuta decided to go for a ram, and make their lies more beautiful. With just one fist, he completely destroyed Holga and the Kejin sitting inside. The crowd was shocked. Yuta realized that his affairs were bad, he did not want to destroy him with one blow and he was amazed at his own strength. But the mecha was still able to fight, and Kejin was alive. The paint flew off the armor, the man said that he underestimated the guy, and admitted his mistake. Kejin said that now they will fight in earnest. Yuta tensely said in his mind that Kejin was a good man, since he could still fight. The man shouted at the guy to try his killer trick. Yuta did not understand what he was talking about, and decided to take the blow with his arms crossed over his chest. But when the Keegan mechanism hit the Elio, it was thrown back by the shock wave. Holga was blown to pieces, and Kejin fell dead. Yuta opened his mouth in surprise. He literally did nothing, and he has already won. After the fight, the guy returned to Nanami and Falma. Jean was glaring at him. He wailed that he asked Yuta to pretend that it was hard to win. Yuta made excuses that he did not know that he would win this way. Now he is unlikely to be able to find a suitable opponent, since everyone saw how easily he defeated that opponent. 
Nanami and Falma wheeled in a cart full of sacks and said it was the guy's winnings. The young man replied that it was the merit of them all together. In the evening of the same day they were sitting at the table. Jean was drinking a bottle of alcohol, and Yuta was leaning against the countertop with a drooping look, complaining that no one wanted to fight with him. Last time he overdid it, it was complete domination over the opponent. He asked Jean to stop drinking and asked if he could fix the situation. The man said that he would have to use a secret plan. At that moment, a group of three guys came to them. They were Yamakura, Haranishi, and Shibai, Yuta's classmates. The young man was delighted with his friends and asked how they were doing. Haranishi haughtily said that even though they were classmates in the past, they were now different people in another world. Therefore, he had no right to address them by their first names. After that, he added that Yuta is as far away from them as walking to the moon. Yuta did not understand what he was talking about and asked his friends what happened. Haranishi shouted and ordered Yuta not to dare to communicate with them as equals and called a former classmate trash. Haranishi said he was an elite with a bonus of 3,300 and Yuta had only two points. Yuta shouted that these were just numbers. Haranishi replied that these were not just numbers and measured Rudia's potential correctly and therefore demanded a respectful tone from the guy. Nanami did not tolerate insults towards Yuta and shouted at these guys not to make a fool of him because they were friends once and Yuta still considered them that way. The guys laughed and said that Yuta had become a slave to some brat. After that, they noticed Falma and asked what kind of cape she was wearing. Haranishi tore the hood off the girl and saw the cat's ears. In a panic, the guys shouted that a beastman was here. Yuta, defending his girlfriend, hit Haranishi in the face. He shouted that although he did not have a high potential of Rudia, he believed that those who enjoyed such things that others were disgusted with were worse than garbage. Jean slapped the table and said he didn't know what the relationship was between them, but asked Haranishi if he was a swordsman. When he did not hear an answer, he offered to settle the conflict in the Colosseum. Yuta wanted to object, because he didn't want to fight against his friends, but the man said that it was their ace in the hole, a fight against three at once. They put the bet at 40 million. Haranishi did not understand why Jean was so extravagant. The man only said that if they did not accept the fight, then they were afraid of Utah. The next morning, they were already standing in the arena. Haranishi and the others had a high reputation. He had already won 10 fights. Each of the guys was confident of his victory, believing to the last that Utah was a pathetic weakling. Alio easily smashed all three opponents with his sword. Haranishi was the last one, realizing that Yuta had deceived them, and his potential was not a deuce at all. Yuta was not particularly happy about the victory. Looking at the magic mechanism of Haranishi lying on the ground, he thought that his classmates had changed by coming into this world. They began to divide people according to a new feature, the potential of Rudia. Have all his classmates changed in this direction? At least, Yuta swore to himself that he would never be the same.